avalanches are really unpredictable. There's always a degree of uncertainty there. We try to, to forecast and do the best we can, but it's always out there. I've seen it and felt it, and I've watched it hurt a lot of people. I've watched it damage properties. I've felt how heavy it is, how uh, powerful it is, uh, how it can strip all control away. Yeah, Fernie definitely has unique challenges. It's got a lot of people skiing here. There's a lot of pressure on the train. The topography, the weather, it's, it's a challenge. And this resort is, it's a beast for sure. This place always surprises me. It's an incredibly challenging and complex place. I'd say 90% of Joe's skier is completely unaware of the level of critical decision-making that goes on in, in our avalanche program to allow safe, happy powder skiing for everybody. You know, our element at risk here is, is skiers, so they're, they're quite vulnerable to avalanches, even a very small you know, size. When talking about opening terrain and do you think it's safe, you have to think about mom, dad, and their five-year-old son. Well, if you know, five-year-old kids involved in an avalanche and terrain that I said that I thought would be good to open, probably wasn't a good idea. It's that 10% that maybe have the lowest risk tolerance, and it, that's the lowest denominator, so you have to go with that. When we open the train, we have uncontrolled public essentially skiing anywhere they want within that train. So we need to be 100% uh, sure that, that it's completely safe and that skiers can't trigger it themselves. What makes this mountain probably unique in an avalanche sense is the train we have. So we've got these five big alpine bowls that all funnel down into one <laughs> little base area. You know, realistically, 75% of our terrain is avalanche terrain. How we attack it, given the different conditions, it's not the same strategy every day. It's, it's a game of chess. And so as a general approach, we try to stabilize the snowpack. We, we will try to control it quite aggressively so that what's left over cannot render harm to our users. That's the fun challenge, you know, us trying to figure out how are we going to get up there, how are we going to control it. And that, that is what makes uh, Fernie challenging from an avalanche control standpoint. We have had a, a reasonable amount of snowfall in the last couple of days. With the high humidity and the winds out of the southwest, we have had some significant cornice growth. So we've been waiting on a little break in the weather uh, so that we can get up there with the helicopter and do some cornice control. Mostly with the helicopter, we're going for cornices. And the cornices are the big overhanging pieces of snow. It's actually safer and, and more efficient to get it done with the helicopter rather than sending the troops up on the ridge, exposing them to the terrain. If we can knock down a big cornice, it'll hit the slope and cause an avalanche. You can imagine having this open door, you're hanging essentially outside the helicopter and you got that air right below you flying around on, on the head walls here at Fernie, uh, right up on along the cornices. Ultimately, the pilot has the final say on all safety and what's going to happen. So it's a very um, high-end mission as far as the pilot is concerned. I mean, they, these guys are awesome pilots here. They get us right into the cornices and we can deploy the shot right onto the, the cornice. <laughs> call a mission it's usually you know when the weather window is there a lot of times that's maybe an hour before we fly if it lifts at the end of the day it's never easy but um, it's always satisfying creating and watching avalanches I mean, there's, there's nothing more exciting than that 
getting up in the helicopter and get to see these natural phenomena really in action and they're extremely powerful and, and it's exciting to watch. When you see a cornice break from the weight of the shot, that's that's Disneyland. That's as good as it gets for sure. For our operation, we'll, every day we have two avalanche forecasters that uh, collaborate to make the decisions. Starting at around two o'clock, two till about four, so a lot of big decisions are made. It's minus 2.8 at the plot right now, and uh, yeah, it looks like we're in for some serious snow tonight. This could be the largest cold front system we've had this year. But it wouldn't surprise me if we get like 30 or 40 even tonight. It's gonna be a big day. So I guess in the afternoon, we uh, need to make a decision about the avalanche hazard conditions for that evening, as well as what we're expecting for the next day. 1023 of the afternoon snow and weather. So tonight, periods of snow heavy at time, 15 to 25 CMs with uh, moderate to strong winds as the cold front passes through. So with that forecast, it will be a AC start for all patrol tomorrow morning. As we leave in the afternoon, the cat crew starts and they have two shifts that run all night long. We put in a cat sheet every night where the cats can and can't go. We need to issue that forecast to you know, promote the most grooming possible uh, during the evening. Whether you're out with friends or dealing with your kids or whatever you do at night, you just always are looking, have I made the right calls for the zones where the cats can and can't go, or did I give them too much of a boundary to get in the curry bowl or whatever? There are not that many jobs that you get more excited the earlier you have to come in in the day. If it's an avalanche control day, we'll show up at quarter to six, boots on, out the door at six. And the forecasters will spend a bit of time in the weather plot. The gunners will shove out the guns, get ready. So the guns will fire. They will give us back information about the sensitivity of the start zones from our above areas. We can do that in the dark. Those targets have been there for 50 years. We know them well and how they produce. So it's our job as avalanche technicians to let our forecasters know what type of problem we're seeing that day. That data either works to support our original ideas or it can also reshape the hypothesis. Some of the things that they may be finding actually may be showing a much higher hazard condition. The data when it's coming into us is completely objective in nature, if you will. But then the organization of that information, that is a very subjective process. striving to be as objective as we can. You do have to have an opinion in the end. You have to be exercising judgment and you have to make decisions. All of that is going to be rooted in subjective process. A big day you might see, you know, a couple dozen, 30 hand charges, maybe more go out. can throw hand charges in specific locations, trigger points, start zones, to try to initiate avalanches with those explosives. There's several trams we'll utilize, which is suspending um, an explosive in the air, where it's a little more effective. When we're 
hand charging, it's pretty standard, big, long tosses over big, unsupported cliff features and, and things like that. So you can stay ridge top and stay pretty safe and away from your start zones. Seeing surprising results keeps up your toes and makes you step back and think, hey, let's make sure we're being cautious, let's go through our checks and make sure we set up properly. Out there, it's more just keeping an eye on my partner and make sure they're going through all the proper steps when hand charging and things like that. How likely is the avalanche to go? Is it touchy or is it stubborn? Like, do you, does it need a bomb? Or when you look at it, does it move? Sometimes the snow is just electric and you just ski around and there's avalanches all around you. If uh, it's not uh, big enough that we feel it's going to be a huge hazard to uh, our staff, uh, we'll go out and uh, ski cut. Approaching a condition within the surface of the snowpack on foot, finding that trigger point or the sweet spot and um, initiating an avalanche. One of our most effective ways to control the hazard here, we have these extensive sign lines, avalanche control sign lines, that are either open or closed. That just removes the people from the terrain. Once there's confidence in the condition that it won't be harmful to people, then we put people all over it. And the people actually help us with the program because they, they modify the snowpack structure. They beat it up and turn it into something that's much more predictable. everyone skis around with transceiver or avalanche rescue equipment so we just want to have a backup insurance plan kind of policy if you will so having the dogs they can search a large area very quickly with their nose these guys are amazing they cover a lot of ground quickly a dog team can search the same area that you know 20 people can search in 20 minutes so as a handler we have to make sure we, we sort of just keep track of where they're covering and uh, we obviously have to keep, keep a good track of where the wind's coming from too. One of the reasons why I wanted to have an avalanche dog was just to be able to volunteer because I, I am a member of my search and rescue group. I want to be able to give back to the community. Being a ski patroller would be just a natural fit to get a dog. I thought it would be a great challenge to see if I could, if I could train one myself. I was fortunate enough, I guess, uh, you know, at a life-changing moment of, of being on, on scene in Fernie here when we actually saved the lifty that got buried back in 2000. And uh, the dog was a big part of that avalanche rescue. And uh, that, that got me my first dog just a couple years later. And um, that was uh, pretty monumental for sure. My canine partner just got his uh, Canadian Avalanche Rescue Dog Association validation in January in Whistler. So he's a two-year-old German Shepherd that's now certified um, as an Avalanche Rescue Dog. The certification is the beginning of the process and after that yearly the dog is, is, is trained and then recertified to make sure that he's keeping up on his, on his searching abilities. And of course we practice weekly with them to, to just make sure they're sharp. It's ongoing every day is, uh, is a training run, whether it's us skiing just from the clubhouse to the morning meeting, um, he's you know skiing in control with me, riding the chairlift, that's training, riding the skidoos, go up the mountain, that's training. We expect the dog to dig um, at the area of scent and to not be afraid to move big blocks of snow. Some dogs will pull the person out, some dogs just like the tug back and forth, but it's supposed to be the most exciting game that they play and uh, really make it fun for the dog. It's hard to have a bad day when you're riding up with a cuddly dog in your lap, up the chair lap. <laughs> If we have a mission to do at the end of the day, we'll prep our shots in the hut. 
Once we get into position, we wait to hear from the timber top hut to make sure we have our clearances in the curry bowl so there aren't any public below us. Being up there, it's, that's where I love to be. And, you know, doing explosive control work is, that's why I love this job. It gets to a point in the season where the cornice has grown so much that it's hard to tell where the actual ridge stops and where the cornice starts. Your perspective when you're, when you're standing on top of a cornice is really, it can be really skewed. So we have bamboo along the ridge system to be able to tell, but the safety line is there in case you step a little too far off to the right and you go through the cornice. It already has proven itself useful a couple times where cornices have fell away and people have been left taut on the rope in their harness and safe. We were trying to stabilize a fairly aggressive cycle. There was a lot of load, warmer temps. Uh, the weekend was coming. We went out into the white, and that was the, the, one of the points of putting that system in, is to give us the flexibility to work even in times when the other uh, strategies can't work. There is a potential always that you could, like if the corner sheared in a way that you ended up going onto more of the northeast side, there's potential that you may get dragged along above the, the cliffs. On that given day, Alexi and I, we did produce some avalanches, um, which I think did assist the program to get back onto its feet when the timing was, was right for it. Even with the precautions which we did take, it was viewed that that was um, outside of what should be our comfort zone relative to exposure for Alexi and I. It refined how we think about it and uh, what's realistic and, and acceptable so that we stay safe. don't get results and there's people lining up at the lifts. It's like, am I not getting results because I've overanalyzed the condition and it doesn't actually exist or is it just not ripe enough and two, three, six hours from now it is ripe enough. originally said the quote, the avalanche doesn't know you're an expert. I definitely remember that always, and always keeping that very objective element of an avalanche in perspective. You have to keep that calibrated when you're making decisions in it all the time, because uh, if you get it wrong, it uh, can not only kill you, it can kill people you're looking after. We've occasionally closed the ski hill down because that risk is too high for everybody. Either due to the scale of the problem or our lack of being able to understand all of the variables within it, you just have to step back. The mountain needs to do what the mountain's going to do today, and you just got to stay out of the way. 